Sam, I just wanted to, uh, it's kind of a side note, it's not even our topic for, for tonight, but on kind of a related note, since we're pointing out reasons you might not want to uh, go to Mark chapter 12. At the end of that parable, right, you, 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 oh, yes. you told a parable, yeah. Yeah. you told a parable uh, that's obviously and indisputably about Jesus, and according to the parable, Jesus is the heir of everything, and Jesus is the Son, the divine Son of God. What happens at the end of that parable? The son gets killed. The son gets killed. Now, does that line up with Islam? How does that line up with Islam? Definitely not. It doesn't, it doesn't even line up with Shabir's view of Jesus being nailed to the cross because he believes he swooned. Yeah. But Jesus says, no, there's no swooning. The son will be killed. The son but we will know be from killed. the rest of the gospel, the son will then be vindicated because God will raise him back to life, to glorious immortality. Isn't there also, when you look at that parable, uh, almost like a... Uh, you see, the, the servants are sent. The servants yeah. are sent. Then at the end, the, the son, son is sent. Yeah, exactly. Does anybody come after the son? Yeah. <laughs> there That's you go. It. There you yeah, go. Amen. <laughs> and not only that, if the, the, now notice, again, by uh, implication and extension, if these are the owner servants and Jesus is the heir, then by extension, the prophets are also the servants of who? The heir. So you mean all the prophets are not just the servants of God the Father, but the Lord Jesus Christ? Mm. No wonder you find passages such as James 1.1, 1, 1, where James, the brother of the Lord, says, a slave, a bond slave of God, the Fa God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm a slave of God, meaning the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet Jesus says you can't have two masters, right? Matthew 6.24, you can't have two lords. Actually, the word is Lord. And in here James is saying that I'm a slave not only of God the Father, but of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And yet he knows Jesus is teaching, you cannot have two masters. You can't be slaves to more than one master. Now, how does James reconcile that with his monotheism? Because James was not a Unitarian. He was not a Muslim. He was a Trinitarian. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we have uh, a bunch of callers already on the line. Already? So we're going, yeah. So we're wow. going to go uh, to our callers. I just wanted to point out for, for, for you Muslims out there who are watching, try to think about this. Shabir Ali, in my view, is your greatest debater when it comes to Christian topics. We don't know how he do on Muslim topics because he usually doesn't address those. So uh, he, doesn't, he, he won't take on a topic like, was Muhammad a prophet, prophet or something exactly. like that. I have that. a standing challenge to him, by yeah. the way. Since standing challenge. Shabir, years, Shabir, debate, anyone? Is Muhammad a true prophet? All you Let's Muslims well out you there. Uh, matter of fact, Shabir, take your pick. Uh, I'd love to debate you. <laughs> Sam would love to debate you. Take your, take your pick. Bring friends. Bring friends. Bring as many friends as you want. You want to get Zakir Naik and Jamal Badawi and a, and, and a bunch of others to join you? We'll take all of them on on the same stage at the same time. We have no hesitations. So you Muslims out there who think you can really make a case for Muhammad, uh, we're, we're putting the ball in your court. We can love we have, your... By the way, not, I don't mean to cut you. Can we have just some rules for the callers to understand this is not a debate time? That when they call in, ask your questions, ask as many as you want, and that they give us the courtesy to at least answer them fully. Yeah, and, and yeah, so, so if, you know, some people will call in and, and try to talk for 10 minutes. We're going to, we're going to have to cut you off. So, uh, so we'll have a call. You can, you can, you can say what you want. We'll, we'll try to give you, you know, minute, minute and a half or so on. Um, and if, if we want to hear more, if we, if, we, if, if we think you need more to explain your case, we'll be glad to invite you yes, to sir. do that. But we can't get into kind of an argument. If you'd like to actually have a, a, a formal debate, you think you're ready for a formal debate, uh, we can make that happen. We can make that happen right here. Uh, on television. Uh, so we're going to take our callers, but again, you, you, you Muslims out there, why is it that your best debaters, why is it that your best debaters, your best apologists, your, your greatest refuters of Christianity would go to a chapter like Mark chapter 12? We got the whole book, the whole book, the whole New Testament declares the deity of Christ. Exactly. The Gospel of Mark declares the deity of Christ over and over and over again, and Mark chapter 12 <laughs> declares the deity of Christ. In multiple ways, not only does it declare the, uh, the deity of Jesus Christ, it declares his death. Those are both antithetical to Islam. Why do your apologists go there, rip a verse out of context, and say, you see there, it lines up with Islam? Why would you do that? Why would your best do that? I mean, shouldn't your best apologists and scholars be uh, a bit more honest with the text? Because when I keep seeing this happen, it, it, it starts telling me something. All right, who do we have on the line first? Mary, we have Mary on the line. Mary, do you hear us? Yeah, I hear wow. you loud and clear. Hi, yeah, hey, Mary, we, really, we really hear you. <laughs> I love you guys. God bless you. Lord bless you, and we love you for the sake of Jesus. Yes, um, uh, we have a room in Power Talk called Message, uh, uh, you know, Prove the Bible's Wrong. And we have Muslims that come in here, like, all the time. Yeah. And 
you know, we try to explain to them that Jesus is God. And it, it's just like a never-ending battle to them to try to explain the deity of Jesus and and to explain to them that Jesus is God. And how is this a good way for me as a Christian um, to explain the deity and to explain them uh, the gospel, which their eyes, their eyes and ears is very close. And I appreciate you. I won't be on long because I know other people is waiting. So thank you so much for your answer. Thank you. All right. Well, well guys, I, I guess the question is, you know, kind of what's what what's the best approach? Because we could we we could talk for days yeah. on how to convince Muslims of the deity of Christ. Uh, but given that some Christians only have just a couple of minutes sometimes, yeah. right? Someone someone comes and hits them in the in a room on Pal Talk or on the street or something like that. And how do you get the message across very quickly? Now, let, let me defer that to CL because you came from a Muslim background. Yeah. Uh, what do you think is an effective? What was effective for you? And what do you think would be effective in that situation? You only, someone comes in Pal Talk, drops an objection. Speak to us because you would have more experience because you come out of that background. Well, first I would say that you have to understand a Muslim, he's coming... He's totally blind. He cannot see how it's possible that Jesus could be a deity. He can't see what you plainly see in the scriptures. So, for number one, I would, before you even get in that situation, I would hope that you would be prayed up. Amen. That you have already oh, invoked Spirit. the Father that put the Spirit upon you so you can minister to these people, that you prepared yourself by reading articles from sites like Answering uh, Muslims and Answering Islam and different sites, and that you got yourself ready so when you encounter these people online or offline that you're ready to say something, you know, that's intelligent. Also, I would throw it back on them because that's not what they're expecting, right? Exactly. What is a God? What, what makes a God a God? You know, they'll say stuff like, well, he's got to be all powerful. He has to have authority. He has to be eternal. You'll start naming off uh, attributes of God. Then you can s simply go to the scriptures and show them where Jesus has these attributes. Amen. So if Jesus has the attribute, attributes of what you said is God, is deity, then what does that make Jesus? Then you put it into their court. They have to either think logically and say, well, this is what a God is. Jesus has these things. Jesus must be a God. Or they have to contradict their own logic. Yeah, yeah and, and that, that's, that's actually our, isn't that our favorite approach, Sam? Is, is to point, and, and, and lots of times we'll actually, as Sam did on the program yesterday, Lots of times we'll actually start, if you're talking to a Muslim, with something that Muslim believes about God, yeah. right? Like so that. yesterday you saw on the program, uh, we had a Muslim caller, and Sam said, what does Isaiah, I mean, what does uh, Quran, uh, uh, Surah 57. 57 verse 3 say? It says that Allah is what? Allah is the first and the last. Then we turn to the Old Testament. What does Isaiah say? Who's the first and the last? Yahweh, God, right? So the Quran says, Allah is the first and the last. The Old Testament says, Yahweh is the first and the last. Isn't it odd, my Muslim friend, when we open up the New Testament and find Jesus calling himself the first and the last? This is a claim that according to the Quran and the Bible, only God can make, and yet we find Jesus making this claim about himself. And he doesn't just do that with that. He does that with a, a, a lot of oh, pl several of titles. And give the reference. It's Revelation 1, 17 to 18, where Jesus claims to be the first and last. The reference to Isaiah is Isaiah 44, verse 6, and Isaiah 48, verse 12. Isaiah 44, verse 6, Isaiah 48, verse 12, and Revelation 1, 17 to 18. And again, the reference from the Quran, chapter 57, verse 3, so they can read that. 57, verse 3, first and last, the title that only God can claim, because that title implies that God is without beginning, without end. Mm -hmm. He was there from the very beginning, because he's beginningless. He'll be there at the end and the consummation of this age. Because he always lives, and yet Jesus claimed that for himself. And Mary, uh, just so you know, yesterday uh, a Muslim was, was asking us about this. He actually asked for more information, and so I put it up on my blog. So if you go right now to answeringmuslims.com, there is a, a list. There's a list of examples like this where the Quran and the Old Testament agree that only God can make a certain claim, and then we find Jesus making the exact same claim about himself. So if you want... A good way, if, if, if again, if this is you, you have limited time, a Muslim that raises an objection, just ask the Muslim, what does the Quran say here? Oh, hey, look, the, the Old Testament agrees with you, and here you have Jesus saying the exact same thing about himself. I and, would, hmm? Oh, not to cut you off. I would go throw ahead, in ahead. one more thing. Muslims have a tendency, if you do that, 
they'll just move on to the next verse. Mm-hmm. Or they'll move on to the next, next topic. topic yeah. And you'll just be changing topics like mm-hmm. five times in a half an hour. Don't allow them to do that. Mm-hmm. Make them deal with the verse that you quoted. Mm-hmm. You know, don't just dis- dismiss it. Tell me, what, do, what does this mean? What are the implications here? Mm-hmm. Make them think about what you're nice. telling them. And that, that's actually, that's a very... Uh, that, that's a very good way to distinguish someone who is asking you a question sincerely and someone who is asking you a question because he's playing a game of stump the Christian, right? <laughs> so if you, if you have, and, and you know, you, you, you still want to uh, share the gospel even with people who are just trying to stump you, but you do want to draw their attention to that. And, and again, you can spot a person who's sincerely interested in whether you can answer their questions because they're going to sit there and let you answer the question, right? They're going to ask you a question and they're going to listen to your answer. Uh, but other people, they're going to ask, and this is true not just of Muslims, this is true of atheists, it can be true of all kinds of people. Uh, but there are other people who will ask you a question, and as soon as you start to answer the question and they see that you can answer it, they're going to change the topic. And you have to point that out say, wait a minute, you, you asked me a question. As soon as I started answering you, you changed the topic. Why? Were, were you actually looking for an answer? If not, why were you even asking the question? So it's important to, to, to draw people's attention to that and then bring them back and say, wait a minute, you, you said I have a problem here. I showed you the answer. Now, Tell me, what do you think about what Jesus said? Why would Jesus, a mere prophet, claim to be the first and the last, which only God should be claiming? You tell me, why would Jesus say that? And if you think he's wrong, why do you call him a prophet? What, what, tell me, tell me, explain it to me. All right, we have, I hear, full phone lines back oh, there. Boy. So let's get... Uh, uh, Make sure it's on the topic, folks. Objections yeah. against the deity of Christ, please. So our phone lines are full. Try to So people who are watching, please try to keep it quick. We're going to try and uh, uh, give quick answers so we can get on to as many callers as possible. But who do we have on the line next? Manu. Manu. <laughs> Manu. Manu. We love Manu. Manu is our, uh, is our Muslim friend who, who calls in to, to quite a few shows. Manu, do you hear us? Yes, I can. Thank you. Manu, uh, do you have a question on the... How are you doing, first of all? Good, thank you. All Good right. Uh, you, uh, I'm assuming you're calling in because you have an objection for us on the deity of Christ. Manu, we invite you to take <laughs> your best shot, or if you disagree with something that Sam said when he was uh, responding to Shabir Ali's objections to the deity of Christ... Uh, so everyone out there, Manu is very intelligent. Uh, he's very well informed. He obviously studies what, what Christians believe. And I have no doubt that he has some of his best arguments against the deity of Christ. And here we are inviting Manu. Give us your best shot, Manu. Right, friend. What's your question? Sure. Sure. Um, uh, you hear me? Yes, yeah, we, we hear, you. hear you. Yes, okay. Thank you. Uh, since you, you're Trinitarians and you believe in Trinity, we can, you can, I cannot separate for you. Jesus, God, as you know, as we call the Father, and the Holy Spirit. So instead of me going talking about Jesus right now, I want to talk about your, the, the Trinity, because it's what's at stake is really your belief about Trinity in, in this case. You what's your question God, about it? Go ahead. You believe God is co, co uh, you, the Trinity you believe in is that God is co-eternal, co-equal, and God, has, God knows the the future from the past. This is, this is all the things you believe. Mm-hmm. I say to you that if you believe that God is, co- and another concept you believe is that Jesus emptied himself of his glory, so that's why he, there are you know, instances that because he's human, he had to be given the words, or he's, you know, he says that God is greater than him. I'm saying according to John 16, 13, when the Spirit yeah. does not come on its own accord, sure. as you believe is the co-eternal, yeah. co-equal God, yeah. and he doesn't have the word, but he, as he hears, he will say the word. That, you have a couple of choices. Either Holy Spirit is not co-equal in the, in the Trinity, and also it presents another problem. The problem is that a, a God that knows everything from the beginning then he wouldn't need anybody to tell him, like God the Father would tell him any of the words. He would already know it. And also the fact that it, it also doesn't, doesn't agree with the fact that the Bible never says the Holy Spirit has emptied himself of his glory. He's always been God, according to you. So there's no instance of the Bible saying that the Holy Spirit somehow diminished at any time in his existence. So this is my objective, ob- ob- objections 
to your belief as, as attorney. Yeah. Okay, well, thank, thank you. Well. All right, Th uh, thank you, can thank I you address very, this? Yeah, thank you very much, yeah. Manu. And uh, just to clarify, just to give a, uh, just clarify the objection, uh, we believe as Trinitarians, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, co-eternal, co co-equal persons of the Trinity, and yet right there in the New Testament, wow. according yeah. to Manu, you have the Holy Spirit is not equal, yeah. is not equal with yeah. the Father. I think, so you know what happened, Dave? Him? I think you did, and no disrespect to my friend Manu, you overpraised him because that was a gross misrepresentation and distortion of Trinitarianism. Not only was it a gross misrepresentation, Manu, and I'm disappointed in you because I expect more from you than to do that, you also distorted John 16, verse 13. Let me first read John 16, 13, and then explain what we believe about the Trinitarian relationships on the basis of Scripture. John 16, 13. Let's read what Manu read or thought he read. <clears throat> John 16, 13. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own, but he will speak whatever he hears. He will also declare to you what is to come. Somehow, Manu assumes that because the Holy Spirit only speaks what he hears, he cannot be God. On the contrary, what this passage affirms is that the Holy Spirit does not work independently from the Father and the Son, which is the heart of Trinitarianism. I don't know of any informed Trinitarianism that says that the three distinct persons do what they want, when they want, <clears throat> contrary to the desire and the will of the others. And Jesus says the same thing about and himself, And I'm going to get to that okay, one. Okay. I'm going to show you how this passage actually destroys Manu's entire case, because what Jesus is saying is that although the Holy Spirit will teach you, you can take it to heart that whatever he says is also what the Father and the Son say because the Spirit only works in perfect union with the Father and the Son and all of them agree on all matters and decisions. So a passage that affirms the perfect unity of the Godhead, you somehow misread to show that the Holy Spirit is less than God. Now let me just use the very context of John 14 to 16. When I mean John 14 to 16, John chapters 14, 15 to 16 to show you that had you actually read the statements before John 16, 13, you would see that Jesus clearly affirms the Holy Spirit is fully God because he has all the essential attributes of God. Let's start with John 14, verses 16 to 17. <clears throat> I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. <clears throat> the, he is the Spirit of truth. Now watch this. The world is unable to receive him because it doesn't see him or know him. But you do know him because he remains with you and will be in all of you. Did you catch it? This spirit of truth is an able, is able, I should say, to indwell all the disciples, no matter where they're at, in order to guarantee the success of their mission. Jesus is saying, the spirit will come to help you to succeed in accomplishing the mission that I'm sending you out to do. Now, Dave, let me ask you a question. What kind of attributes must this spirit have in order to be able to indwell a group of individuals at the same time, no matter where they're at, and guarantee the success of their mission? Can you tell me what kind of It would attribute? have to be uh, at, at, least, at least omnipresent and mm -hmm. have the power as well to carry out whatever he wants, so omnipresent and uh, 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 omnipotent at the very least. And yet Manu wants to convince us that this spirit is not God but a creature. Mm -hmm. Good job, Manu at trying to convince people who know their scriptures, right? So you see, he indwells a group of individuals and guarantees the success of their mission. So what John 16, 13 means in context is that the Spirit does not speak on his own initiative, deciding what he wants to do, but he always speaks in perfect union with the Father and the Son because that's all they can do. Now going back to what Jesus says to really hammer this point, mm -hmm. Jesus says the same exact thing in a context where there's absolutely no doubt Jesus is claiming to be God, even though he's not the Father. And what do I mean? Let's go to John chapter 5, and let's read verses 19 to 30. Now watch this. Remember the words? He will not speak on his own initiative. He'll only speak what he hears. And by the way, that shows that they're distinct persons in communion with one another. We believe that the distinct persons of the Godhead speak with one another, Manu. They have communion with one another, right? And they love one another. So thank you for affirming that the Spirit is not the Father and the Son, but a distinct person in perfect communion with them, even though that was not your intention. But let's read John 5, 19 to 31. And I love this passage because what Muslims like to do and Jehovah's Witnesses like to do is quote the first part of verse 19 and stop. What do I mean? Then Jesus replied, I assure you, the son is not able to do anything on his own. And they stop there. You see? Can't be God because he can't do anything on his own. God can do everything. But wait, let's finish it. The son is not able to do anything on his own, but only what he sees the father doing. 
For whatever the Father does, the Son also does these things in the same way. Wow. When we read the statement in context, it affirms two basic truths. Number one, the Son is not an independent deity doing what he wants. He always does the Father's will to the Father's delight and pleasure. Number two, all he can do is what the Father does. Something that no creature can ever say with a sincere heart. Can you imagine any creature saying, I can only do what God does and whatever he does, I can do in the same way? Does that sound like a creature? What no. does that sound like? That sounds like someone who believes he's fully God and has the same ability that the Father does, and yet he doesn't act independently from the Father, neither does the, the Holy Spirit. So chalk up on your studies of the Trinity, because either you haven't understood it or you deliberately twisted it in order to score a, t a cheap debate trick. But let me finish it. A couple more verses. I know we got a lot of callers, but I do want to do justice to the question. Now let's continue to make sure that we don't misunderstand what Jesus is saying. Because Jesus can do whatever the Father does and only can do what the Father does, this is an explicit testimony that Jesus thought he's God. Let's go on and see what he says. For the Father loves the Son and shows him everything he is doing, and he will show him greater works than these so that you will be amazed. Now watch this. And just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so the Son also gives life to anyone he wants. Does that sound like a creature who thinks he's impotent? Or does this sound like a person who thinks he can do whatever the Father does, such, such as give life, and he gives it to whom he desires, whom he's pleased to give it to? What does that sound like, CL? But it sounds like uh, if I can do what you can do, we have to have the same nature. Thank you. So although he says, I don't do anything on my own initiative, I can only do what the Father does, mm -hmm. is that a denial of his deity or simply an affirmation of the perfect union enjoyed by the Father as the Son, Holy Spirit? Let me just finish it with these last two verses for the sake of callers. Just read the entire chapter. Because Jesus says, as the Father has life in himself, so too is granted the Son to have life in himself. And he says, a time is coming. John 5, 25, with 28 to 29. He says, a time is coming where those in their graves will hear his voice. In the context meaning the voice of the Son of God. And those who hear will live, come out of their graves. Wait. John 5, 25 and 28 to 29. Jesus says, a time is coming and it is now here where the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God. Those in the graves will hear his voice and come out to live. You're telling me that the Son, by just the power of his voice, will raise all the dead from their graves? And yet, this is supposedly a denial of the perfect union and the deity of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit? Mm -hmm. You serious? Yeah. Come on, Dave. <laughs> See, I'll mm. come on, help me here. In fact, isn't it true that one of the names of Allah is that he is the raiser of the dead and the yes. life giver? Yes, that's one of his names and attributes. And yet Jesus says, I am the life giver and I raise the dead. And yet Manu wants to convince us that neither the Holy Spirit nor the Son is God. It's almost like Manu expects that if the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are co-equal, that then they have to do the same thing at the same time at the all times. The same way, right? Yeah. Is it? Well, that, then there wouldn't be Trinitarianism. That would be either modalism, right? Or mm -hmm. tritheism. Thank you. And that's what, what we believe. Yeah, and, and actually, I mean, if you think about it, because you know, Muslims do this a lot, they pull out a verse and they say, you see, if Trinitarianism were true, they wouldn't have said this. Jesus wouldn't have said this. The, the Spirit wouldn't be doing this, right? Yeah. And if you think about what the Muslim version would be, yeah. think about this for a second. According to Manu, this verse should have said, if Trinitarianism were true, if the Spirit really were God, here's how the verse should be read. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will speak on his own initiative, totally separate <laughs> from the Father. That's yeah. what it should have said. Yeah, of course. If that's, what we sh that's what the passage should have said if the Holy Spirit were God. He speaks on his own initiative. Who cares what the Father and Son have to say? Well, yeah. that would be, well, that, that would, be, that would make him a separate God. Yeah. We are yeah. Trinitarians. We are Trinitarians here. We're not tritheists. And, so, and the, the, yeah. the, suggestions, the suggestions that Muslims have for what the Bible should say, they just don't line up with the truth. And we can be thankful that this was written under inspiration of the Spirit and Amen. not under inspiration of some of our Muslim Two quick scholars. points, Dave. Number one, notice the fallacy of false dilemma. He gave us certain options and said these are the only options you had to choose from. And you, you are, you're a philosophy uh, professor, and you know logic. Mm -hmm. Now, how logically fallacious was that? That's what you call that in logic. 
He well, said, uh, these are only choices. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, it, 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 the fallacy of false dilemma, saying, "Ah, it's either this or it's this." Now, which one is it? When there, there, are, there are other options uh, available to us. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what I would, I would call that. Yeah. I mean, just. Uh, I mean, how do you read a passage where the Holy Spirit is clearly doing things? that only God can do, exactly. and saying that he's perfectly in line with the Father, that the very heart, and then again, as Sam pointed out, Jesus, Jesus does, does the same exact thing. same thing, saying, I do all the same things that the Father does, but I don't do things on my own initiative. I only do what I see the Father doing. That is perfect Trinitarianism. Precisely. Perfect unity among the three persons of the Godhead, and yet each one has the attributes of God. That's the heart of Trinitarianism. And yet, just as Shabir Ali goes to a passage which constantly declares the deity of Christ and says, you see there, it doesn't. Uh, other Muslims look at a passage which clearly promotes Trinitarianism, pull something out and say, you see there, uh, that, 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 that doesn't fit. That just doesn't Can fit. I ask him a question real quick? I know we got mm -hmm. callers. Now, if Jesus is a Muslim, CL, Mm -hmm. And Tawheed al-Uluhiya, or Ibadah, meaning that Allah is the sole creator who alone is to be worshipped. Mm -hmm. Could a Muslim Jesus say this in John 5, 22, 23? Same chapter, okay. same context. He says, moreover, the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son mm -hmm. just as they honor the Father. Oh. So here Jesus says, you must honor me in the same way you honor the Father. Now, if he's a Muslim, could he say that? And why not? Well, he wouldn't be able to say that. That violates the uh, the number one sin in Islam, shirk al-Akbar, which we spoke about earlier. To say that I can do what the Father can do, and the Father is Allah, that I'm making myself equal with Allah, I'm making him, well, from an Islamic standpoint, how they would view it, yes. a partner with Allah. Yeah. So, and I mean, to be honored you know, the same that. way as Allah is honored, wouldn't that mean that he's saying that you must worship me the same way you worship Allah? Exactly, God? exactly. And, and these, ah, are, and these ah. are the passages Muslims will go to to try and show yeah, man. That, what, that Islam is true saying, maybe, and Christianity you know is false. Maybe Manu hasn't been on for a while. Maybe he hasn't caught up on his studies. Maybe that's why he was off today. But Manu, we love you and we pray in Jesus' name. He opens your eyes. Amen. Because your only hope of salvation is Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Because Muhammad can't save you. He couldn't save himself. Amen. But Christ is the Savior of the world. Mm -hmm. We love you, Manu. But we have to go to a break right now. We'll come back with more callers. We'll see you again in just a moment here on Jesus or Muhammad. Oh,